I was asked to give this presentation because of the 165,000 of you guys, uh, or you folks, uh, not too many of you know who AUVSI is. So I'm going to do a, just a little bit of uh, explaining of who we are, and then I'll talk about the subject of unmanned aircraft systems. So this is the agenda that we're going to follow. So a little bit about AUVSI. Uh, we're an organization that's been around for 42 years. Uh, we predominantly have come out of the, the defense side of the house. Uh, our vision is to educate, communicate, uh, advocacy, and leadership. All right. The whole purpose of our, our vision as a nonprofit organization, just like yourself, is the advancement of unmanned systems to basically help humanity and to change the world. Okay, this is what I call a revolutionary technology on an evolutionary path. Some people uh, hear about disruptive technologies. Well, it is disruptive, but it's also revolutionary. So I interchange those words together. Uh, we operate in the air, ground, and maritime world. Okay, we don't do space, we don't do medical, and we don't do manufacturing. That's more of an automation situation. So I'm concentrating on those things that have about two degree of freedom and more, that have uh, in intellectual properties, uh, artificial intelligence, have mobility to them in order to assist human beings. And if you look at these unmanned systems as a commodity, it's a commodity which is the extension of the eyes, the ears, and the hands of a human being to do those dirty, dangerous, difficult, and dull jobs. So every time you hear a situation like Fukushima where we had a nuclear uh, situation, that's very dangerous to send human beings in to do that type of work. Well, these systems have the ability to take the extension of our eyes, ears, our, our information that we possess, the people that know how to do that work better than anyone else, it allows them to do it in a more effective, efficient, and safe manner. So that's why we build these systems. You utilize this technology, and a lot of what we've come up with has been based in, on the 77 years that you folks have been involved with this. You do it for a recreational purpose. I'm doing it now as an extension of a human being to do those missions out there. And, and when you do this, you, you create jobs, you create economic benefit, wealth, money, you save lives, you save time, and you save effort. This is why we do these systems. I have about 600 corporate members I have about uh, 7,500 individual members as well. We do have competitions at the uh, high school and uh, college level, so many of you may be involved in some of these uh, programs as well. These are the competitions we sponsor. I have a sister organization, which is our foundation, which is a charitable uh, organization. They give out about maybe $250,000 worth of prize money uh, for a vari variety of different uh, competitions that we do across a wide spectrum. We do some events. Our biggest event this year will be happening down in Orlando. Uh, it's uh, going to be May 12th through the 15th, and actually on May 11th, we've coupled up with Space Florida, and we're actually going to be flying uh, UAS uh, to do demonstrations, and which happens to also be Mother's Day, so I don't know how they scheduled that one. That wasn't my, do my idea, but uh, it, it's the world's largest. So if you want to see unmanned systems from the ones that fit inside your hand to the size of a 747 or the, uh, the Navy's uh, 47, uh, the one that goes off aircraft carriers, it'll be a mock-up will be there of it. So it's the very large to the, the small, and it's air, ground, and maritime as well. We have a, uh, a netted area which is about five times bigger than the one you have. We fly them uh, constantly, as well as we have a tank for maritime and we have a ground one that we operate ground systems in as well. We also do a program review in November and that's the government programs. So any of the government programs, NASA, any of the ones that are involved with that, to tell you where these, these programs are, how much money they're involved with, what their application is and the things they do. Advocacy is a big deal for us. Uh, so we do a Hill Day. So we, I have two registered lobbyists on my staff. So we advocate for the advancement of this technology and the utilization for it. We have a driverless car summit that we're now this year going to combine with the uh, Transportation Research Board. It's going to be done out in California in the uh, July time frame. Uh, we have events globally. There is an I in our name for international, so it's not just the United States. And I would contend to you that fielding of this technology may be done in another country before it's done here in the United States for the simple reason that other countries don't have as restricted or a, a higher standard of safety like we do. So 
this is something that you'll be seeing more and more of and I'll talk to it in my presentations. We have a lot of different events. Uh, half my staff is younger than my son who's 35, so I have a very uh, uh, um, electronically uh, intelligent group of folks, so we're tweeting, we're texting, we're doing every mode of, of media that you can imagine. Uh, again, on the Abbasque side, there are caucuses that exist on the Hill. There's two on the, on the, on the uh, House side and one on the Senate. Uh, I know all of the co-chairmen very well. We have a lot of conversations. So I testify on the Hill uh, quite a bit. Uh, the last one was in front of Senator Leahy from the uh, subcommittee, one of the uh, uh, defense subcommittees. And uh, we also do a lot with the other different federal agencies. All right, a lot of what we are about is education or, edu or disseminating good information about what this technology is all about. There is a lot of misconceptions of what this technology is, what it can do, how it's going to be utilized. I will tell you, for any unmanned system, safety is paramount. If it's not safe, we will never field it, we will never utilize it, we will never be able to take advantage of it. So those 70 people that went into that reactor in Fukushima that literally knew that they were going to die, that could be avoided. Anytime you hear of a search and rescue that's called off because of bad weather or can, uh, getting dark or whatever, they call it off because they don't want to endanger the people that are physically looking for those persons. Well, an unmanned system doesn't care if it's day or night, and it can operate in all kinds of different weather conditions. And if it should go down and you lose it, it's no big deal. Okay, you didn't lose a human life. So there's a lot of great applications to utilize this. One of the best ways to monitor other species that are on this planet, okay, is not to have it with a human being, but to do it with one of these type technologies that allow you to gather information. It's all about situational awareness. And I'll talk a little bit more of the pros and some of the downsides that happen with this as well. It gets into some of the privacy issues that we talk about or you've heard on the news. Um, Again, we have a, a website that you can go to about human potential. So these are all the, the good, uh, heartwarming stories of how this technology has saved lives or been utilized to uh, interact with either weather or with animals, uh, poachers in Africa, in Nepal, for rhinos and elephants, where the devastation is taking place by utilizing this technology. They've been able to uh, have a tremendous impact on the poachers. So things of this nature. And you can see we have chapters. We have 29 different chapters. There's one here in San Diego. And I have to call a shout out to uh, Monica England, who uh, she's down here in the front row. The, one of my staff that was supposed to be here, uh, two of his family members got sick. He had to leave. Monica volunteered on her own to come and man the booth and to disseminate the information. So, uh, and, and I flew out here this morning. I've gotten less than four hours of sleep. So if I start rambling or if I start getting a little crazy, she's uh, going to hit me with a, a Red Bull, and hopefully that'll keep me going till the end of the presentation. Okay, so these are some of the services and the products that we have. A lot of it, again, is information. It's communication. It's the ability. We actually have a database. So if you tell me, I want to know how many UASs exist that weigh less than 10 pounds, can fly more than 30 minutes, can carry a, a, a mission package payload of 5 pounds, uh, I can tell you that. I can tell you where they are in the world. Okay? So I have a database for air, ground, and maritime that can, if you say this is what I'm looking for, because I've got a sensor that can do all these great things, but I don't know where to, who to go talk to or where this can be utilized. We have that type of information. So we are a facilitator of B2B, business to business, and also dealing with the regulatory aspects, because if you can't get into the national airspace, none of this happens. Okay? So, uh, we deal at it from every aspect, and I tell my staff, if we don't field, we fail. doesn't make a difference why. doesn't make a difference because it's a technical issue, if it's a regulatory issue, if it's a statutory issue, if it's an emotional issue. Right now, we have an aversion as a human race for any machine injuring or killing a human being. Okay? But we still have technology every day that does that. We have a technology called the automobile. We lose over 32,000 lives a year to the automobile. We have over 6.3 million accidents. It costs us over $256 billion a year because of uh, medical costs and damages, but yet we still drive cars every day because the upside of that technology has been proven over 110 years since Henry Ford introduced it to what the downside is. That's called risk acceptance. We have no idea what the risk acceptance is 
for a technology called the unmanned aircraft systems. Okay? Now, I use UAS. You may have heard the term drone. You, you hear about these systems called a variety of different things, unmanned aircraft systems, and that's what the FAA and Congress call them. That's the legal term, and the FAA is the regulatory body that controls the national airspace. So if, if, if Jim Williams and the FAA start calling them drones, we'll call them drones. But until they change their mind, we're not changing ours. And there's a reason for that as well. The, uh, the RPAS, the Remotely Piloted Aircraft System, ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization, which is a global organization, they call them Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems. So the word system is used in both cases. And the reason being is that they did a study and they said, they put the, they put the, the word drone up and they put 20 different pictures of aircraft that fly. And they say, pick the picture that most associated with the word drone. More than 80% of the people picked a Predator with a Hellfire missile. The majority of people out there, when you use the word drone, think of something that's milit militized, weaponized, autonomous, and large. Okay, these things are not that. You've, you've got them here. You wouldn't call, you know, if you call this a drone, that's not what most people think about. So there's a misconception about that. In the other word, we call it a system. The reason we call it a system is the thing that actually flies is only about 30% of the system. It carries a mission package payload. It has a communication, a data link there, or an, an RC link that goes between it. It has a controller. There's a bunch of them that you can see all here. That's part of the system as well. And it has a human being. There's a person. Now that person is either in the loop or on the loop, but they are involved in the system. So whether you have automated part of it where you tell the system, okay, I want you to go to this altitude, fly for three hours doing this, and then come back, you're still involved in the system. There is a human being involved with it. So that's why we don't use the word drone. Someday we may be able to recapture it, but right now the majority of people don't have the right idea of what that word means. Here's just 30 examples of how you would utilize a UAS or this technology. And some of them are, are amazing. When you look at farming, and we call it precision agriculture. So why would you want to use a UAS to do precision agriculture? Good question, right? Well, we believe that about 80% of all the applications in the first three to 10 years that we get into the national airspace are gonna be used for precision agriculture. And the reason being is a farmer knows how to farm better than anyone else. He or she knows what they need to know in order to grow crops. What they need is good information. So you can fly a UAS very low to the ground at a steady pace and get the feedback to tell you whether or not the ground may need some uh, nitrogen or phosphate or other chemicals. If you want to grow corn as opposed to soybeans as opposed to peas, there's a different composite of the ground that grows that the best. Well, the farmer knows what it is, but he's got to get his, his ground to be that way. So information is key and critical to him or her in order to make good decisions. And that's what this technology brings to you. Once you've done that, they now have developed sensors that you can put on the bottom of this that can actually monitor the photosynthesis process of an individual plant. So now you'll be able to keep track of every plant that you have to see whether it's healthy or not. And now you can determine where the bugs are, where the insects are. And rather than spray the whole crop, which means you have to buy a whole lot of pesticides and a lot of it gets into our groundwater, now you only have to buy the amount of pesticides just for the area where the bugs are. And, by the way, because you've got a, a, a quadcopter or some sort of a, a rotary wing type system, you can actually determine what the downwash is going to be. So if you're only this high over the plant, you can put the downwash in a very uh, uh, methodical way. So now you use less pesticides ending in the ground, more on the plants. Good for the farmer, good for the environment, good for everybody. So there's a lot of practical reasons. And then the same thing goes with harvesting. Now John Deere, Caterpillar, a lot of the big uh, guys that are in farming, they already have ground systems, the tractors. These are, you know, three or four, five hundred thousand dollar machines that are basically automated. Uh, they say in the future they're gonna have a dog and a human being in them. And the dog is there is to bite the, uh, the person if they, if they try to push any of the buttons, okay? Because the systems know how to do it better than the individual there, but you gotta have one there because of the safety says you gotta have it. So, as you know, we're getting smarter and smarter with cars. Cars are getting smarter every day. They have the ones that can tell you when you're crossing the line. They can tell you what you do when you're backing up. They can stop you if you're within 25 miles an hour and there's an object that comes in. They're going to get to the point where they're smarter than the human being. 
Right now, as I said, we have 6.3 million accidents in the world. Someplace between 87% and 93% of all accidents are caused by the human being. So what's the weak link in the system? Automobile, the human being, okay? So that's, what you're gonna, that's the reason why you want to be able to use this technology. And it goes across the board. But any unmanned system, if it isn't safe, will not be utilized. So eventually we will have automated vehicles or driverless cars. We did an economic impact. And this is a very conservative estimate. So if you look at it from either being you know, boldly stated or very, very conservative, this is at the very, very conservative. As we go through this and update it and look further, the numbers are only going to go up. The bottom statement says, for every day that we're not flying in the national airspace, we as a nation lose $27 million of economic impact. This is jobs. This is money. And I mentioned about uh, agriculture, why it's going to be so big. Right now, we have about 7.1 billion people in the world. They estimate by the year 2050, we're going to have 9 billion people. That's a net gain of almost 2 billion more people in 36 years. Someone has to feed these people. Most of them are going to be in South Africa, going to be in China, going to be in Asia, going to be in Russia. But you still have to feed them. Okay? So that's why I say this technology may be utilized in other places before here. Has any of you folks been to China in the last three, three years or so? Okay. How's the air quality? Okay. He said, bad. Okay. They predict that in the next eight to ten years, the air quality is going to be so bad that it's going to be unbreathable. All right? And also, if you're in China, you get a car, it has even license plates and odd license plates. You can only drive on the days of even or odd numbers, okay, because of the congestion. There's a situation where the government may have to step in at some point in time and mandate that you have a better transportation system to get the people from point A to point B. And that's all you're talking about is mobility. 110 years ago, we got this thing called the automobile. People said, oh, you're never going to replace the horse, okay? Here we are 110 years later from Henry Ford introducing uh, the, uh, uh, the assembly line. We still have horses. The horsing business is a multi-billion dollar industry. We didn't do away with horses because we like to ride them, we like to bet on them, we just like to have horses. Well, when you have automated vehicles, you're not gonna do away with cars because people like to drive 64 Mustangs, pickup trucks, and we like to ride in our vehicles. But you're not gonna go back and forth to work. How many people ride a horse to work every day? Doesn't really happen, guys, and that's exactly right. So it doesn't mean you're gonna get rid of what you already have. We're always gonna have NASCAR, because people like to watch NASCAR. They, you know, it's, it's you know, hundreds of thousands of people go to view it. You're still gonna be doing that. We still have the Kentucky Derby, all right? We didn't do away with that. This is a technology that will allow you to get from point A to point B. This is my grandson, Joseph. Joseph is a digital native, okay? At 16 months of age, Joseph knew how to use an iPhone and an iPad. So if any of you have kids that are less than 10 years of age out there, you're nodding your head yes, they are born with this technology. They will always know being connected. Many of us in this audience are digital immigrants. We migrated to this technology because we had to. And sometimes we kick an extreme and we fight with it. But these guys are connected. And when Joseph in 13 more years has to get his driver's license and you tell him he has to get in a car and drive for an hour and can't be connected, he'll have convulsions. He won't know what to do because he's never not been connected all of his whole life. Okay, I'm getting close here so I want to leave you a question, for, question and answers. So this is why this technology is coming forward. It's these young people that have no app, you know, apprehension about utilizing this technology. Here are some recent examples. Uh, all over the world. This presentation will be made available to you if you want. But we're utilizing these systems more and more every day to be used as information gathering devices for you. And you say, well, what about the privacy issue? Okay, that's a very good question. Here's some more of the uses. You can look at these afterwards. Um, agriculture, media, monitoring, big applications, good reasons to do it. Saves money, save lives. Okay. These are all the different bills that have been introduced that are anti-UAS. These are all the different states. Last year, 20 of them got defeated, 9 of them passed. Some sort of anti-UAS bill. And people are concerned about privacy, as you should. But I would contend to you, these are the states that have been active with it, is that, and these are the ones that's, you know, a lot of support for it as well. 
a lot of different legislation. I testified in, Senate, in the Senate Judiciary Committee on that, and there's, a, there's two of them coming up. If you look at those last two bullets, next week, January in, in 2014, Congress is looking at this. So there's a tremendous reason why you're doing it for because of dollars and jobs. So the Fourth Amendment was written in 1791, 223 years ago. And it basically says you have rights to privacy. It doesn't say how you violate privacy. There are peeping Tom laws that are in every state, and there's privacy laws in every state. And it says if I put a ladder up against your house, looking through your window, I'm breaking the law. If I did it from across the street with a high pair of binoculars, I'm breaking the law. If I did it with a manned helicopter outside your window, I'm breaking the law. And if I did it with an unmanned system, I'd be breaking the law. So it doesn't say how you break the law. It says if you break the law, you are going to be held accountable. We all have privacy. But with every piece of technology that we get, we lose bits and pieces of our, of our privacy. So if you have one of these cell phones and you have that purple line that says, I want to go from point A to point B, I know where you are. If you have a car with GPS in it, I know where you are. If you go outside, anytime out of your house, there is now, out of that 7 billion people, more than 78% of all human beings on this planet have one of these devices. And guess what? I can take your picture. I can monitor you. I can keep track of you. Okay? If you drive, when I testified in the Senate Judiciary Committee, I told Senator Leahy, from the time I got up, I got in a car with GPS. I used my Bluetooth. I drove through 31 lights, I passed 19 banks. I pulled into a parking lot that had cameras, I walked outside a building that had cameras, and I walked inside a room that had cameras. You had 100% accountability of where I was from the time I left my house to the time I testified. That's the world we live in. So the issue is not about UAS spying on you or privacy. What it's about is data. It's the collection of it, it's the analysis of it, it's the storing of it, it's the dissemination of it, and the destruction of it. I don't care how you collect it, that's what it's about. It's not about how you did it with either a manned system, unmanned system, a, a fixed camera, or whatever. It's what happens with that information. Look what happened to Target, okay? Hundreds of thousands of people have been affected by this. People are hacking into data every day. Now, can this technology be fused at? The answer is yes. But our position is, is that this technology should be technology neutral in laws. Whatever is appropriate for manned systems flying in the national airspace should be the exact same for unmanned systems because that pilot that was flying in that plane is now located on the ground. He or she still is responsible for that platform that's flying, but now it's in a safe mode. So if they're flying into a hurricane or, or a volcano, it's a better way of doing business. It saves lives, okay? Or when you go into those dirty, dangerous, difficult, and dull jobs. This is why this technology is coming. This is why it's going to be here. Uh, I'll open it up for questions if you have it right now. Uh, I only got through half the slides, but I hope you get the idea of what we do. And there's my grandson again. We have a live mic. We'll try to get to you. Just put up your hand, and we'll try to get the mic for any questions. Anyone? I went back. Michael, thank, thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, just one question that I have, and I know that uh, AUVSI over the years has been uh, very much involved in the de Defense Department industry of UAS, and I know that you're now transitioning uh, to support uh, the civil domestic operation of UAS. How, how's that going to change the look of your organization? Uh, excellent question. I would say to you right now, of the 600 corporate members I have, most of that is because of the defense side of the house. When we transition to the civil and commercial, and it's all about safety, that number can be exponentially higher. When you look at all those different applications of what could take place. So we as an organization, our motto is, if we don't field, we fail. So we have to find out what are the factors that go into allowing you to fly these systems. If you want to make money, you want to have a job, you want to have your kids' careers, how do we do that in a safe way? There is no magic bullet here, I'll tell you that right now, and I use a, a, an elevator as an example. Everybody's comfortable with an elevator. That's wonderful. That is a revolutionary type technology. It took over a hundred years from the time that the elevator was invented and when it was used with safety. It was invented in the early 1800s. It was just pulleys and, and levers in, in physics. But in 1865, 
Elijah Otis came up with a braking mechanism. That's why you see a lot of Otis elevators. It's the braking mechanism that was key and critical. It took a hundred years later before we had elevators that we didn't have human beings pushing the buttons. Because it took another 50 years just to get to the point where people would utilize it. And then it took 30 years where we still had people inside. Well, if you didn't have elevators, you wouldn't have buildings higher than three to four or five stories high. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't have skyscrapers. If you didn't have skyscrapers, you wouldn't have cities. It would change the world. The world was changed because of a, of a technology called the, the elevator. But yet, us today, we think nothing of it. You go back 200 years ago, and it was, it was inconceivable to have a machine take you 35, 170 stories in the air. They would have said, you are absolutely nuts and crazy. This is the technology we're talking about. This is a revolutionary technology on an evolutionary path. I hope that answers your question. Anything else? If not, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Michael, thank you very much.